It is my pleasure to introduce uh, Leticia Rodet, who's going to give our uh, seminar today. Leticia got her PhD at IPAG in Grenoble, uh, working with Hervé Bust, was your thesis director, right? That's my understanding. Working on uh, aspects related to directly image uh, exoplanets with sphere and dynamical modeling. And now she's currently a postdoc working with Dong Lai at uh, Cornell University on other aspects of orbital dynamics, you know, with applications to a bunch of different cases, which are quite cool. So uh, without further ado, Leticia, take it away. Thank you very much and for the introduction. Uh, thank you very much uh, for having uh, giving me the opportunity to give this talk. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about giant planets and how they shape uh, planetary systems. So I will begin by a general introduction on our current knowledge on the architecture of extrasolar systems, focusing on giant planets. My first part will be a bit more general also, a bit, bit general, but focusing on the dynamics of giant planets, how they impact the mechanism uh, by which they impact the planetary system. And then I will focus on three specific problems that I think are interesting uh, related to giant planets, dynamic and specific parts of, of the planetary systems. So where uh, are the giant planets? So initially, before we, find, we found all the exoplanets, we thought that we were going to find only um, cold Jupiters because we thought that uh, giant planets formed only a bit external to the snow line, just like uh, all Jupiter in our solar system. However, you probably know that the first exoplanet that was discovered around a solar type star is what we call a hot Jupiter with a very, very short orbital period. Uh, since then, we found, we found some cold Jupiters, some uh, new hot Jupiters, and also some intermediate companions that we usually call warm Jupiters. What are interesting also is that we find companions that are not only a bit external to the snow line, but are very, very far away, much uh, farther away than the planets uh, in our solar system. So when you account for the bias in the detection method, you, think, you see that uh, most of the giant planets are indeed called Jupiters uh, with orbital period between one and 10 years. However, you can find giant planets at every part, at every separation in the planetary system. It is interesting to note also that giant planets are not ubiquitous around solar type stars. Uh, so depending on the definition of giant planets, the mass range, it, uh, the, the occurrence rate can vary between 10 and 50%, basically. But uh, what's, uh, what can be noted is that the more massive the planet is, the less common it is. Uh, in the, the direct imaging method, um, some direct imaging surveys were able to, uh, to have a, systemic, a systematic survey of uh, cold Jupiters, so with um, separation more than 5 AU and uh, mass more than one Jupiter mass. And they found that around solar type stars, such uh, giant planets uh, with large separation uh, were found around less than 10% of solar type stars, even less than brown dwarfs companion, which uh, it's pretty telling because brown dwarf companions are known to be scarce. We also have some more information on the uh, orbital properties of those companions. Uh, you can see on the, on the left, you have the radial velocity planets, a uh, function of the mass and eccentricity. So there seems to be a tendency uh, for the more massive planet to be more eccentric. This is something that we see also when we compare with the transiting planets. Uh, but what can be noted mostly is that um, giant planets are not, uh, not confined to the circular orbits. They can be very eccentric, actually. Uh, when you look on the right, you have the um, result from uh, direct imaging, so the giant planets with large separations. And you can see that there seems to be a, a, a very important distinction between the eccentricity distribution of giant planets and the eccentric distribution of brown dwarfs, uh, which are even more massive. So giant planets, they are eccentric, but on average, they tend to prefer uh, mild eccentricities, whereas brown dwarfs do not have this preference. Uh, so this uh, characteristics would be is uh, very interesting because it would uh, it gives some constraint on the formation history of those companions. Uh, however, uh, the, we think that the formation history, <laughs> the formation theories are, are quite complicated actually for those companions. So it's not so easy to derive some nice constraints from those distribution. Uh, actually, we, we have three 
paradigms to, to, to create giant planets currently. The core accretion model uh, is uh, what is usually invoked to, ex uh, to explain the formation of the planet in the solar system. Disk instability uh, is used to create giant planets at large separation quite quickly. And stellar-like formation is a bit like we when we don't have <laughs> other explanation, the planet is very far away or have a very large mass ratio. Uh, so this could be, uh, this would be, yes, a giant planet forming like a binary companion from the collapse of the proto, the initial cloud, um, gaseous cloud. So each of these picture uh, is not homogeneous, uh, actually. When you look on the right, you have a, uh, or the core accretion method, for example, is composed of a lot of different phases, and each of them are, are, are important and debated. And it's a, it, yeah, that's a, each of these um, of these paradigms um, uh, has has some uh, hidden complexity. Uh, even if we were able to predict which characteristics, uh, or what would be the characteristic of the companion created by each paradigm, which we are a bit able to do, uh, another problem is that there are. There, there is then some evolution um, because the, the uh, giant planets do not retain the architecture of, of, in which they, they were formed. One of the uh, one of the mechanism that make uh, that that uh, creates this uh, uh, further evolution is orbital migration by interaction with the gaseous disk. Another mechanism is planet planet interaction, and this can change dramatically the architecture and so blurred a bit more uh, the initial condition and uh, the formation history of the planets. So what we need uh, usually in order to, to explore this complexity is a lot of data to be able to do some statistical, uh, statistical study like before with the eccentricity distribution. So how do we get those, this data? Um, giant planets are found mostly uh, through radial velocity, uh, through the ra radial velocity method, looking at the radial velocity wobble of the host star. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you can uh, transit is also detecting a lot of, cool, of, um, of giant planets, but it's mostly hot Jupiters. Uh, on the opposite side, uh, you have direct imaging, which is uh, solely discovering cold Jupiters for the moment. And then you have um, microlensing that also uh, finds some, um, yeah, some giant planet at, at a lot of different separations. So during my talk, I will focus a bit more on cold Jupiters and the system that can be directly imaged, uh, because I, I worked very, I'm working very closely with the direct imaging community, as Shen said, during my PhD, and and still now when I'm, uh, yeah, I'm collaborating with different teams, and uh, actually uh, I think there are some lots of advantages for someone interested in dynamics to look at directly imaged systems. One of the advantage of direct imaging is that it focuses on young systems, uh, young systems where the dynamic is, might be still unfolding. Some uh, dynamical mechanism takes millions of orbits to, uh, to develop. And so this is typically the age of the, of the system that we observe with direct imaging. Uh, related to that, um, direct imaging, um, the young systems also have brighter disks. This can be gaseous disk, so the protoplanetary disk that has not yet dissipated if the planet is young enough. If the, yeah, if the system is young enough, like in PDS-70, uh, which is the only confirmed system uh, where a planet, uh, two planets actually, are accreting. And on the right, you have uh, the case where you have a nice debris disk. Uh, the debris disks are also brighter when they are younger. And, uh, and uh, they are known to interact strongly with, uh, with the giant planets. And so it is interesting to, to constrain the architectures a bit more. Another aspect uh, for the advantage of direct imaging is the, the information that we get uh, from the orbital pitting, so from the data. So this is where I'm much involved uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the direct imaging community, this and dynamical analysis for, of the stability of the system. But when you, um, direct imaging is the only detection method that enables the constraint of all of the orbital elements of the companions, plus the total mass when you use Kepler third law. So this is very useful. Although in this case where I showed here at JT504, we uh, have a very scarce orbital coverage, which is often one of the problems of direct imaging because we have long orbital period. 
So the constraint is not very uh, impressive, but as uh, time goes by and we are improve our orbital coverage, the orbit can be very well constrained and all of the orbital elements can be constrained. Moreover, if we have an idea of the age of the system and, and if we have some characterization of the spectrum of the companion, we can estimate its mass uh, thanks to the evolutionary models. Those models are not well calibrated for young giant planets yet because uh, we don't have so much data, but we are more and more able to have some direct, uh, some radial velocity or absolute astrometry data uh, on top of the direct imaging systems. Um, and this allows to constrain the mass of the companion only with the dynamic independently from the models. And we are using those systems where we can do that to constrain the evolutionary models and, uh, yeah, and have more uh, reliable constraints on the future, on the future estimates. Okay, so now I will focus a bit more on the dynamics of, of all, all these systems, the history and future of, uh, uh, of, of planetary system where you, when you have a, a giant planet. So I would say that the most uh, studied topic in celestial mechanics is the stability of planetary system. It's a very complex issue. Even when you only have one or two planets, uh, there are still a debate over the of the stability uh, limits and uh, stability constraints. So when you add, um, yeah, roughly when you add uh, one planet to a planetary system, uh, you can define what can be called a chaotic zone uh, around the orbit of this planet, where if you put a companion or a planetesimal in this chaotic zone, then you are sure that uh, the planet, the system will be unstable. So it's, it's really some, uh, some idea of uh, some rough characterization of the stability. Of, of your system. And there have been lots of ways, actually, a lot of approaches to characterize this chaotic zone, uh, from the most theoretical one uh, to recent uh, innovative uh, numerical methods. A rule of thumb that we usually use is using the here radius, so um, with the, the mass ratio of the and semi major axis of the planet. And the uh, yeah, rule of thumb is that the chaotic zone is. Uh, of the order of magnitude of three heel radius on each side. So this is interesting for uh, the observations actually to be able to quickly characterize the stability of a system uh, because uh, it, it can really help uh, get uh, the most of on, out of the data. Here you have an example with HR8799. Uh, this is a very famous directly image system where with four, um, with four giant planets. And you can see in black on the left part and on the right also, it's the data. So uh, the planet position of the planet uh, with time. And you can see the fits, the orbital fitting is the, is the colon lines. And it's very, uh, not very constraining actually the data because of the scarce orbital coverage. But if you add the constraint that the orbits should be stable on the on a sufficiently long term, then uh, the constraint becomes much more, much more constraining. <laughs> you have much more constraint on the orbit of your system, on your system. Uh, it helps also predict the future position of the companion and it helps then predict the, the, the observation, help the, the future observations. On the theoretical side also, of course, it's in, important to understand what can trigger instability and stability in planetary systems. Uh, we are suspecting now that the, the formation history of planetary system is far from being uh, very calm. Actually, it can be very violent with giant impacts creating uh, collision, ejection. This can create a free floating planet population. And even in all solar system where uh, the orbits are pretty circular and coplanar, uh, the long-term stability is not guaranteed, especially Mercury uh, could be ejected or could, be, could become unstable before uh, the end of the sun's life. Uh, so uh, the paragraphs in blue are kind of a self-promotion, but we are working, for example, uh, to show that this topic is quite, uh, still has some interesting things to do uh, in celestial mechanics. We are working with a PhD student in Cornell, Jiahu and my, and my boss Tong. We are working on the uh, computing the chaotic zone uh, when you are, have a uh, damping force from the gaseous disk. How does it change the limit of the chaotic zone and the time scale which instability develops? So when uh, the system is unstable, uh, there are there is there are three uh, main outcomes 
that you have for your planets. They can get ejected, they can collide, or they can be swallowed by the star. The latter possibility is actually pretty rare uh, when you have initially almost nearly circular orbits, which is, which is thought to be the case post-formation. Uh, then the probability uh, to get ejected versus collide, um, it's really dependent on the property of the planet and especially its major axis. It can, it can really change the branching ratio, as we call it. This is very important because it shapes, if you have an ejection in your system, it really shapes uh, the architecture, the remaining architecture uh, of the planets. Uh, like you can see on the right, there is, this is a property, the properties of the rem remnant planets when you had an ejection of another planet. Uh, you have some large eccentricities that uh, were produced by the planet-planet scattering. And this is a way to create uh, large eccentricities that could explain parts of the eccentricity we observe in giant planets. Uh, there can be also a more complicated outcome uh, except uh, on, on top of these three main outcomes. Uh, for example, you can excite uh, the orbit of a planet until its eccentricity becomes very high, and then short-range forces, such as tides with the star, can uh, decrease the size of the orbit and, and stabilize the system. This is called high eccentricity migration, and this process can lead to hot Jupiters. So there are many ways to create high eccentricity migration. Uh, it's, uh, planet planet scattering may not be the most uh, uh, the most common one, but it is uh, probably one of them. And actually, it is interesting to note that a high eccentricity migration is something that can be uh, used for problems in astrophysics uh, outside the planetary systems. We are working uh, still with the same PhD student and uh, with Dong. We are working on a way to apply high eccentricity migration uh, to the formation of black hole binaries because uh, we are um, it, it, in the LIGO and Virgo data, there are lots of uh, black holes collision that uh, remain to be explained. And uh, this is, um, yeah, there, there are really phenomena uh, with the, in the three body problems that are very similar to the mechanism in planetary system and that can help explain the formation of those black hole binaries. On the other hand, if a system is stable, it does not mean that it stays idle. Uh, the architecture can evolve still significantly while the system remains stable. So this evolution is periodical and it happens on time scale much greater than the orbital period. We call that secular time scales. An example of that is the von Zippel lidov kozai mechanism uh, that uh, is basically an exchange between eccentricity and inclination when you have significant initial uh, inclination. But there, um, we are usually speaking of this mechanism, but um, it, ignoring that uh, we don't need to be in this regime in order to have uh, non-negligible uh, secular, um, secular oscillation in the planet architecture. As soon as you have a bit of eccentricity or inclination uh, in your system, then it will create this secular uh, mechanism. So uh, you can see here uh, the basic mechanism behind that in Hamiltonian maps. So it's two different cases. Uh, basically, each line is a fixed Hamiltonian. So it corresponds to a, a system with a fixed initial condition. And you just follow the line to see the evolution of the system. On the, on the left, you have the case where everything is coplanar. You have a planetesimal, and you have a giant planet, uh, which is eccentric outside. And Due to this eccentricity, the planetesimal's eccentricity will oscillate around the forced eccentricity uh, given by the eccentricity of the perturber and the semi-major axis ratio, which means that the farther away the perturber is, the giant planet is, uh, the smaller the forced eccentricity will be. On the other hand, on the right, you can see the case, uh, the opposite case, where everything is circular, but the uh, outer giant planet is misaligned. In that case, you will also uh, the planetesimal's uh, inclination will oscillate around the forced inclination, but this time the forced inclination is, uh, is exactly the inclination of the perturber. So even if the perturber is very far away, uh, the forced inclination will always be its inclination. The only thing that will uh, change is the time scale associated with this oscillation. So a nice example on how secular interactions behave in a real system, it's the beta-pictoris system. It's a very, 
emblematic system in direct imaging because it's the first one uh, where a planet has been imaged, uh, the B. And very recently, uh, planet C has been discovered uh, closer to the star. And it turns out that this uh, planet C is quite eccentric, more than 0 0.3. And actually, when you look, uh, those, all, those are both um, giant planets. And when you look at um, and the dynamical evolution of this system, it is thought to be stable. Uh, but however, the architecture will evolve uh, periodically on time scale of uh, hundreds of thousands of years and that the eccentricity can vary by, um, by as, as much as, as 0 0.1 uh, on this time scale without uh, the stability being, um, uh, being endangered. So it is interesting to be uh, that, that uh, the architecture that we usually suppose fixed are actually varying uh, much. And this can have consequence on the debris disk, for example, which is quite perturbed in, in beta pictoris. Uh, the secular mechanics only works when you don't have any mean motion resonance. Uh, mean motion resonance happens when you have commensurability between the orbital periods. Uh, there's a lot of things to say about the dynamic of mean motion resonance. It's uh, usually quite complex, uh, but uh, because, of, uh, because we found some of uh, mean motion resonance in the solar system, especially the Galilean uh, satellites, we uh, people has been study studying this uh, this dynamics, and they found that uh, they are equilibrium points. And as such, if you think that uh, the formation history in systems involve a large uh, orbital migration, uh, lots of system, lots of planets should be in mean motion resonance because they would have been captured when they would cross mean motion resonances. However, it turns out that not a lot of planets are in mean motion resonance, which give us some information on uh, how the migration occur uh, in the early evolution of planetary system. Uh, it can be linked also to the property of Gaseous disk. So it's, it's really a very interesting topic. And we'll talk a bit more about, uh, about some, uh, yeah, some, some results about this. But speaking of the moons of giant planet, I'd like to say a few words on that also. Um, the moons of giant planets are interesting because they can be the size of a terrestrial planet as Ganymede shows us. Uh, although no exomoon has been detected yet, we think that it is possible in the near future, especially by transit. So studying the dynamic of exomoon is a bit more complicating, complicated than just studying the dynamic of the planets, because you have to take into account spin orbit coupling and tidal dissipation, uh, which can be non-negligible and affect their long-term stability. Uh, there are some new things, that, so we, we, we can understand uh, quite nicely now the stability of moon in our solar system, but when you, uh, it is interesting that we are still learning lots of things on the formation history of giant planets, and each of the different aspects of their history has, impact, has an impact on the evolution of the moons. So how do the moon react to the migration, to planet-planet uh, scattering? Uh, there's a lot of things to, that remain to be done on, on this topic. And a few small parentheses about that. Um, the numerical study of moons is not so easy, actually, because the algorithm designed for long-term integrations, uh, the so-called symplectic integrators, uh, do not handle well uh, strange architectures uh, with the different centers of rotation. Uh, they prefer a sun and uh, embedded orbits. Sometimes they add a stability to take into account a second one. But basically, it's, it's, uh, it's not optimized for that. This is why my supervisor in Grenoble, Hervé, uh, created Swift AGS, uh, which is an integrator that is able to model any kind of nice uh, hierarchical system and is very well adapted to, to the study of, of, uh, of moons and satellites. Uh, the problem is that this integrator did not, into, did not take into account uh, the, the cl possible close encounter, could not handle close encounter and hierarchy change. So this can um, be problematic if you want to study, for example, planet planet scattering. And uh, this is where I worked a bit on that during my PhD, uh, extending the code into uh, ODIA, which is uh, basically the same structure, but uh, is able to take into account the evolution of the architectures and soon uh, to model very um, trust, trust um, uh, very nicely close encounters. Uh, so we are uh, working currently with Shen and the researchers from Nice uh, to use ODIA on the 
close encounters between giant planets harboring the system of moons. Okay, so now I will focus on more specific uh, problems. And one of them that I think, uh, well, it's a very hot topic and it's very interesting, it's how giant planets impact uh, super Earth. So the, uh, more specifically, how cold Jupiters uh, impact super Earth. Uh, recently, there are some statistical insights using Kepler data and some radial velocity surveys uh, that says that cold Jupiter are, are uh, most of the cold Jupiters are accompanied by super Earth. And those companions, Jupiter, cold Jupiters, are typically misaligned. And we know also that the giant planets are statistically more eccentric. So it is uh, very uh, logical to think that these cold Jupiters will have an unnegligible influence on the super Earth. One of the possible influence that is interesting to monitor is the misalignment that the giant planet can induce uh, between the super Earth, because this would typically break the co-transiting geometry so that we can only see one super Earth transiting instead of all the super Earth in the system. This, uh, this is something that is observed in the data um, with the excess of single transiting system in Kepler data, uh, which is, uh, is often called the Kepler dichotomy. And uh, the possibility that giant planets are, are causing this uh, Kepler dichotomy, it's a it's, uh, it's, um, legit hypothesis. A nice way to study that uh, is, uh, we can study this problem actually analytically. This is a very nice way to have some insight on this problem. So the, the thing that you want to do is to compare the perturbation from the giant planet to the coupling between the super Earth in order to see which is the strongest and if it's able to create misalignment within the super Earth. Uh, so what will happen uh, intuitively is that when the giant planet is, um, is strong, if its perturbation is strong, so if it's close and very massive, for example, then it will interact strongly with each of the super Earth, which will act independently, and they will have some, uh, at some point, some misalignment that will, will grow. On the other hand, if the giant planet is sufficiently far away, then the uh, super Earth will strongly interact with each other and will kind of average, uh, average out so that it can be considered um, as, a, as a fixed uh, system being perturbed by a giant planet, and they will not uh, grow misalignment between them because of the giant planet. So here is a small animation to show that. It's the uh, orbits of the super Earth, the, of two super Earths perturbed by a, an unseen giant planet. It's seen edge on. On the left, the giant planet is weak, and on the right, its uh, perturbation is strong. You can see that the, the, the misalignment between the, the super Earth is strong on the, on the right, and uh, it's small on the, on the left. So um, mathematically, this can be uh, characterized uh, by this uh, coupling parameter, which is the ratio of the precession rate due to the giant planet and the precession rate due to the super Earth uh, on each other. This is in the case where you have only two super Earths. Uh, using this coupling parameter, uh, and almost only this coupling parameter, we can predict the maximum misalignment that can be reached by the super Earth. So you can see on the left, you have the maximum misalignment between the super Earth as a function of the coupling parameter. There are two regimes. When the, the coupling between the super Earth is, uh, is strong, uh, then the misalignment scales with the coupling parameter. And at some point when the uh, giant planet becomes uh, stronger, uh, the, the misalignment saturates around the perturbation, around the uh, inclination of the perturber. So we recently were able to extend this study to mean motion resonance, uh, to, to involve mean motion resonance uh, on the, uh, between the super Earth. Because we are, there are some, uh, some super Earths that are observed in mean motion resonance. And it's very interesting actually, that, um, there's not a lot of, um, of study on how giant planet impacts mean motion resonance. Uh, would it be able to break the resonance? What would be the consequence on, on the misalignment angle when you are add resonance to the secular dynamic. So actually, it seems, uh, it seems a bit complicated with an extra degree of freedom uh, given by the resonant angle. But actually, uh, it's possible to extend very uh, similarly to, to before uh, and find some, some nice uh, 
nice relationship by using a different coupling parameter, which is very similar, but the precession rate in the, well, between the, the super Earth involves some resonant terms. And by using this coupling parameter, we are able to create a very similar, um, very similar relationship to predict the maximal, the maximum mutual inclination between the, the super Earth as a function of the of the um, resonant coupling parameter. Uh, so what what we derived from this study is that pin motion resonance are very robust. They really re they are resisting a strong perturbation from the from the giant planet, and also that actually the uh, the misalignment is smaller when you have a resonance. It means that the mean motion resonance is strengthening the coupling between the super Earth. So there's uh, still a lot more to do involving super, uh, mean motion resonance. Here we were restricted ourselves to cases where all the orbits were circular. Uh, on the other hand, we know that mean motion resonance tend to couple uh, eccentricity, uh, excitation to inclination excitation, so we need to take eccentricity into account in the future. And so here we focused on the second order mean motion resonance because it's the mean motion resonance that involved inclination. The first order mean motion resonance do not interact with the inclination. And the first order mean motion resonance is very, uh, it's, it's much more studied, but even with this very classical resonance, there are things to, that remain to be done. We are working with another PhD student in Cornell, J.T. Lone. Uh, to, um, to, to uh, model uh, the orbital alignment of eccentric planets when you, uh, when you add mean motion resonance. Okay, so now uh, I'd like to extend a bit more this, uh, this problem instead of looking at the influence of giant planets on, uh, on super Earth, on, on terrestrial planets. Uh, I'd like to look at uh, their influence on planetesimals and dust. So we are looking, we are finding a lot of debris disk uh, now, some well, dozens of debris disk. And it is interesting to note that they have very nice architecture, very characteristic architectures. Uh, narrow rings, broad rings, gaps, uh, spirals, asymmetries. Uh, all of this is very interesting because it probably says a lot on the formation history and the current architecture of the, of the system, the planetary system uh, that harboring the star. And how was to start? Uh, it's a bit similar actually to how uh, in our solar system, the asteroid belt and the Kuiper belt uh, indicates us, uh, uh, give us an idea on the architecture of our solar system. So I'd like to uh, show you an example uh, of uh, one of the rare system where we have found both a giant planet and a debris disk. So this picture uh, can be, a bit complicated to look at at first sight, but I will introduce you to the system, which is very, very interesting. So I encourage you to, to, uh, yeah, to, to hold on. So it's a HD 106906. Uh, it is a very young system in the Skosen uh, Association. You can look in the middle of the picture. Uh, there is uh, just behind the black circle, there is a binary star, a tight binary uh, that, that is. Um, hidden here by the coronagraph. And this binary is uh, surrounded by a Nedjan debris disk, which you can see is a symmetric. Uh, one, of, one side is brighter than the other. When you zoom out, uh, you can see that the debris disk is actually continuing on one side, uh, extending up to very uh, large separations. You can look at the scales here. Uh, the bar is basically 500 AU, so much more than the extent of our solar system. And finally, uh, one of the dots here is actually a giant planet, uh, the giant planet of around 10 Jupiter mass, which seems to be misaligned with the debris disk. So of course, this giant planet uh, has a very large orbital period. And so uh, its orbital architecture, it's, it's not very well constrained. Actually, we're very lucky that a team was able to show that the, uh, to, to point a relative motion of the, of the planet uh, in more than 10 years. But this, uh, this motion is not enough to really constrain the architecture, of course. So looking at the debris disk and how you can create all the structure we observe uh, could be a way to help constraining the property of this mysterious giant planet that is so far away from its host star. So there are many ways to study uh, debris disk. And actually, so on the left, it's an analysis that we did during my PhD. 
um, it's, uh, you can just use the secular mechanics uh, on every planetesimal in the disk and look at the large scale structure that is developing. And actually the binary star and the giant planet uh, is creating a spiral within the disk and also an extension on one side and not on the other. Uh, this, is, um, this is something that is similar to the data, actually with an asymmetry of the brightness that is on the other side as the extension. You can uh, numerically add a bit more complexity to the model by adding some, um, some um, uh, super particles, some collision. This is what another team did and they find a very similar conclusion and were able to recreate the observation. And the structures in the disk suggest that the planet orbit is eccentric uh, in both study. So it is a nice thing that we were able to predict the orbit of the planet, you're just using the, the structure of the disk. Um, so uh, this, uh, this uh, example of HD 106906 was in the case where the giant planet was not directly uh, um, scattering the planetesimals. It was just creating secular variations from far away. But sometimes, especially when the system is young, the giant planet can directly encounter the, the planetesimals and it causes, um, it can cause uh, the same thing, uh, the same outcome that in the planet-planet scattering case, it can cause ejection, collision, or you can send the planetesimal towards the star. And in the latter case, they become falling evaporating bodies. So the Beta Pictoris system is uh, an example of how um, giant planets uh, can, uh, of a, a system where you have giant planets and you observe falling evaporating bodies. We observe thousands of them every year. Uh, understanding the outcome of the scattering, the probability for a giant planet to scatter um, a planetesimal towards the star is a very nice uh, topic because it can be applied not only to falling evaporating bodies, but also to planet envelopment. If you consider a giant planet sending a smaller planet into a star, and also white dwarf pollution, which is a very uh, very studied topic uh, for the post-main sequence stars. Uh, so the probability to send a planet decimal towards the star, it um, depends uh, very much on the orbital property of the giant planet. As I, as I told you previously, when you have nearly circular orbits, the probability to send planet decimal into the star is, is uh, zero, essentially. But when you add uh, some eccentricity to the giant planet, then it becomes more and more uh, likely that the planetesimal can send into the star. So it does become uh, depend a bit on this probability on what how close is close to the star. Uh, if you have to send the planetesimal very close in order to it to get completely swallowed, or if it's enough that it's like just grazing uh, the star. Uh, this mostly actually changed the time scale. Uh, by an order of magnitude, but it does not change so much the probability. Um, you can uh, note that the time scale actually of the scattering is very is quite small. Uh, it's uh, typically uh, less than one million year, and so this is something uh, that's important to note because uh, systems that we observe usually are, are older than one million year, and so if we observe falling evaporating bodies, uh, we need to account for we need to replenish uh, the uh, surrounding of the planet, uh, maybe by a collision, a nearby collision or, or, or strong dynamical events, or we need to find another mechanism that instead use secular time scales. This is usually the main uh, theory for a beta pictoris involving secular mechanics and mean motion resonance to provide a, a, a slower mechanism to provide falling evaporating body to the star. Uh, we were uh, happy actually to have um, uh, in uh, we are study we studied this uh, topic in Cornell and we were happy to recently have found a, a way to have some analytical insight that could really help uh, having uh, uh, giving some having some idea of uh, the likelihood um, for a giant planet to be the perturber uh, very easily without doing any any simulations. So we were able to uh, derive the minimum distance that the planetesimal can uh, approach the star as a function of, uh, of the, the orbital and physical characteristics of the planet. So uh, before people used 
to do this kind of analysis only in the circular case uh, using the Tisserand parameter. But we were able to extend this result to eccentric cases and also to non-test mass cases for the, for the planet SE. Finally, I'd like to uh, tackle a bit more exotic topic, which is the uh, influence of flyby um, on, the, on the planetary system and the role of giant planets in this influence. So why discussing stellar flybys? It's actually a good question, which is not very, <laughs> very, uh, which is quite debated. Uh, the impact of stellar flybys on the average planetary system. Because usually when we studied the impact of stellar flyby, which is basically a star passing by, uh, and passing by close to the planetary system, close enough that it can have some influence on the orbital architecture of the planets. So yeah, usually stellar flybys were thought to have an influence only on systems that belong to globular clusters. Uh, so um, clusters of stars that were quite dense and uh, very dense and that remain for with a lifetime that is uh, basically yeah, very, very long, billions of years. On the other hand, uh, it, uh, it is true that if we think that most stars are born in dense clusters that are usually unbound, so it's, uh, they are very short-lived. But depending on the density of those clusters and on its lifetime, they, there can be some significant impact of the stellar environment during this, uh, this um, uh, early time, the early ages on the, the system. So in order to give you an, an order of magnitude of uh, how likely it is, uh, here is the, this is a small computation of the rate of close flybys. That means less than 50 AU from the star. Uh, in the case where you have a non-absurd uh, density for the cluster, um, you end up with a rate which is basically 10 per giga year. So one every 100 million year which is not a lot actually, because we think that um, the birth cluster dissipate quicker than that. But, um, but the, the birth conditions of star are so poorly known that the order of magnitude of the density and lifetime can vary significantly. And this can change everything for the likelihood of the average planetary system to have been changed by a flyby. So this topic was also recently rekindled by uh, a nature data, a nature paper uh, involving Gaia data that showed a correlation between hot Jupiter occurrences and um, the uh, local relative density of the host star, uh, of the, uh, the local stellar density uh, of the host star, which means the number of uh, nearby companions of the host star, basically. So the correlation is very, it's, it's striking. However, the meaning of this uh, relative local density is, is unclear. It, uh, it may be linked to the remnant of a denser, um, absolutely dense, um, not only on the relative sense, but really dense clusters. And so the, the correlation could be explained like that, but it could also be linked to uh, some uh, other parameters like age or or galactic dynamic. But overall, it just uh, rekindled the, the discussion on the influence of the stellar environment on the planetary system. And there are nice ways actually to explain how stellar flyby can create hot Jupiter. One of the most likely scenario is the following. Uh, you imagine that you have initially a cold Jupiter, which uh, is basically the, the default location for a, a giant planet. And you have an outer planet on the exterior of the system. If you happen to have a passing star uh, going um, passing close by, then the, the main impact will be on the outer planet. And the outer planet can be misaligned because of this passing star. If this misalignment is more than 50 degrees, then you can enter the von Zipoli of Kozai regime and, the uh, and, uh, and create some high eccentricity oscillation uh, for the cold Jupiter. When you combine that with tidal forces, uh, then you can create a, a hot Jupiter. So we computed that uh, in, uh, when you suppose that you have this initial architecture, then 10% of the close flyby will end up uh, with uh, creating a hot Jupiter. So uh, again, it depends on how likely a close flyby is. 10% uh, is not so much, uh, given that you always, 
you also have to assume this particular architecture, but, uh, but it really depends on uh, how likely the, the close flyby is. Uh, um, another way to create to, to change the architecture of planetary system with the flyby, uh, but even more res less restrictive actually, uh, is to create a cascade, an, an outsiding cascade of orbital misalignments. So this is linked to another study that is very similar to the nature study uh, that found a correlation between stellar clustering and the apparent multiplicity of super Earth. So it could suggest that the stellar flyby is able to break the co-transiting geometry the same way that I discussed before by creating some misalignment between uh, inner super Earth. And actually that's not very difficult to understand. We just need uh, the passing star to misalign uh, an exterior companion, and then it can create, uh, propagate this misalignment to the inner system. As I told you before, the forced inclination uh, does not depend on the semi-major axis ratio, so even a small inclination uh, for the outer companion will, can propagate to the super Earth. So we need to evaluate still uh, what's the optimal hierarchy for that and what's the likelihood that the close flyby will do that. So lots of the, most of the time people studying, um, studying the influence of flyby on planetary system do so with large simulations. The problem is in this case, there are many variables to consider and it's hard to derive general uh, results. So we try to do really minimal uh, dimensionless and body simulations and then to combine them uh, with analytical scaling and the, and the previous results that I showed you on the influence of giant planets on the misalignment of super Earth. And we were able to derive some nice uh, formulas in order to predict uh, the number of flybys per system that is able to break the co-transiting geometry as a function of the architecture of the system. And again, it depends on this coupling parameter that I introduced before, which is logical because it's very similar. It's a very similar problem. In the case where you have a single exterior companion, then you have this uh, result where you have, um, you know, as a function of, of the mass of the companion, you have the optimal uh, position of the companion as a function of the, the coupling ratio. And, and it gives you, uh, yeah. uh, you can see that for a, a one Jupiter companion, um, it's uh, the, for, for the normal coupling ratio, uh, this is again 10% um, of the system would be would be concerned by this uh, by, by this uh, uh, this mechanism. However, we showed that if you add another companion, a second companion to the problem, uh, then the likelihood that a close flyby will create the misalignment is, is uh, very very high. It's, uh, it's almost 100%. So just uh, before concluding, I'd like to uh, talk a bit more again of uh, HD 106906, because actually it's uh, this uh, system, it's not over what we can say on, on it. Especially uh, the location of the planet is, is pretty puzzling. Uh, being so far away from the host star and also misaligned with the disk, it is not clear how it was created. So it could be uh, a failed binary star, well, triple star, but the mass ratio is very close to a planet, a planet to star when we look at the, at the host star. So instead we uh, hypothesized during my PhD that the planet formed within the, the disk uh, close to the binary star, and then they, it interacted with the binary star and got ejected uh, on larger orbits. And then uh, you need another body to stabilize, to stabilize the planet and prevent it from going back into uh, the, the neighborhood of the binary star, and this could be prevent. This could be uh, this perturbation can be given by a stellar flyby. So this article was more of a proof of concept because it was a bit uh, a far fetched to have all those components uh, working together. But it turns out that two years later, a Californian team found a binary candidate uh, that was uh, li likely to have had a flyby with HD 106906 um, in the near past. So they look at the, into Gaia data and looked at the position and velocity of nearby star and went back in time. And they saw that this, uh, this uh, couple, this, this binary star, uh, was uh, likely to have, uh, so to have had a close encounter with the HD 106906. However, the uncertainty uh, in the, into the, the catalog was not enough to, what well, was uh, 
was large enough so that we cannot really conclude on how uh, important this flyby had been for the, for the system. You can see here this map for the, the closest approach uh, of each of the, of the star of the binary. So it could have been very, uh, very impactful with the, the binary, uh, one of the star uh, passing very close to the host star, like uh, thousands of uh, AU, which, which, which is close given that the, the orbit of the planet is 700 AU. But it could also have been one parsec away, in that case it would have, um, it would have clearly no impact. So we just need a bit more constraint on the, the position and velocity of this binary, and we will be able to conclude on the, the influence of this stellar flyby. If it is uh, indeed a, a significant flyby, then it would be the only planetary system with a, a, confirmed, uh, yeah, a confirmed flyby that impacted the architecture. Okay, so as a, as a conclusion, uh, giant planets, I think, uh, uh, I hope I convinced you that they are very important uh, to the architecture of planetary systems. It is convenient because they can be discovered via basically all the major detection methods. Due to their mass and the fact that they are statistically more eccentric, they, they are really um, uh, having a, a non-negligible influence on the dynamics of every part of the planetary system. And also due to the fact um, the cold tributaries are, are, can propagate the perturbation from the stellar neighborhood, and in particular, the propagation, the perturbation of stellar flyby. Uh, I, it is the, my proximity with the direct imaging community led me to, uh, yeah, to not only use the statistical insight from the, from the surveys, but all, also a focus on the nice systems, benchmark systems that had lots of data and from which it is very, very nice to study because it, 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 um, yeah, it leads us to, to invent new mechanisms, new scenarios for, for, to understand all the peculiarities that they, uh, they show. Yeah, and uh, of course, um, yeah, the theoretical work is nice, but it's always nicer when you have more data. And uh, yeah, we are waiting for new instruments on the VLT, on the ELT. GWST, and uh, most importantly, I think uh, we will have a new, a large um, amount of data on the on giant planets, new giant planets provided by the uh, last data release of Kaya, but I'm expecting very much. Thank you very much for your listening, and I will be pleased to answer any question you may have. Well, good stuff. Thank you for the talk. Um, so, so let's see, do we have any questions? Just raise your hand if you had a question. Okay, the first one I saw was uh, Jean-Baptiste. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. I have two questions, a practical one and a more naive one. First is, uh, uh, how are the angular sizes on your slide 36 for different debris disks? And the second naive one is, uh, is there any connection or possible interaction with uh, to detect the Nins planet in the solar system. Uh, could, could you repeat, sorry, the, the second question? Is there any connection to find the Nins planet in the solar system? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah. So the, okay, I can show again the, the slide. Uh, so uh, yes, this one. Uh, the angular size, that's, uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure that it's, uh, <laughs> Probably, I'm not sure it's the same size. Actually, oh, that's a that's a good question. So typically, I know that uh, the HD one hundred six system, it's a HD one hundred six nine hundred six system, uh, which is the F. Um, it's a, a few hexagons. Uh, so I would say, uh, yeah, one hexagon is probably the uh, the size for for HD one hundred six nine hundred six uh, for the uh, for the correspond bar. corresponding distances in AU. Oh, in AU, it would be uh, so. Uh, yeah, for the it's there usually systems are around 100 parsecs, so uh, it's like 100 AU uh, for for H one hundred six nine hundred six. For the other one, uh, yeah, Beta Pictoris is uh, is more. Yeah, no, it's it's different for Beta Pictoris, which is closer. Uh, it would be uh, yeah. I think I think the the size of the bar here that gives the unit is really uh, angular size, and for each system the, the distance changes, so it's it's a bit different. The beta pictorial system it's it's uh, more probably around uh, a few dozen AU. Basically, the, the, those those structures are, are very are quite large large scales, uh, okay. a bit like yeah, uh, okay. between ten and uh, one hundred AU. 
So yeah, for the planet nine, uh, yeah, that's a very nice uh, 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 comparison actually. Uh, the system that I kept talking about, the HD 106906 with the giant planets that is far away. Uh, it's um, the theory that we are uh, trying to, to uh, create. It's, it's very similar to the theories that people uh, are thinking of uh, to, to create uh, planet nine to explain how it would have gotten uh, so far away. Uh, this process of uh, an ejection from the inner planetary system and then a stabilization by uh, uh, the stellar environment. It's something that is uh, very similar to, to, to the planet nine uh, uh, formation history. Uh, so so it, it, can, it can really help, I think, uh, studying the uh, planetary systems uh, to know how likely this, uh, this phenomenon could be. It, it is hard to imagine that most of the planetary system had this uh, very specific uh, history with an ejection and then stabilization, but if we if we see that there are a lot of um, of giant planets or Neptune-sized planets uh, that are uh, on the outskirts of planetary system, like Planet Nine would be, then it would really give us more insight on the on the, on the the likelihood that we have such a planet in the solar system and what could be the formation mechanism to form it. If I answered your question. I'll just note really quickly that Falk put a little comment saying that the bar in those pic in that picture was uh, 50 AU. Okay. Uh, okay. I guess he looked at him. <laughs> are there are there other questions? Well, otherwise, here I'll, I'll ask one in the meantime. Um, I was curious. I, I like that um, your demonstration showing how you could have a system of, I guess, super Earths or whatnot, where uh, from an outer perturber you end up with basically differential procession between the different ones yep. and so they have different inclinations so i couldn't tell from the the movie you show where it was going whether um the, it was stable or not is that a real is that like an end body simulation or is it like an analytical no it activation? was it, it was an end body simulation so right. it, it was stable yeah actually it wow. was stable that's yeah, cool it, how big can you drive like mutual inclinations between planets that way so the the studies we did were a bit focused on the uh, smaller inclination, but it's uh, it could be. I think uh, I go up to twenty degrees or oh. yeah. it, without destabilizing. That's really cool. No, and, no, it, it was it was very stable. And they're planets yeah. that are very close together, and they still get up. Um, yeah, the the size, the their mass is very is quite small, but it's just that the, the giant planet is uh, yeah. Uh, that's really cool. Oh, I, I see. Franck has a question as well. Go ahead, Franck. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for the for the great talk. Uh, one very quick question at the beginning, you had the, you had the kind of a, a, a pie chart with the the giant planets detected with different techniques, and the the, the, the different uh, proportion seems a bit odd. Like there were nearly uh, there was a huge amount of uh, imaged planets compared with transits, while there there is a huge number of transiting uh, giant planets. So uh, there may be something I did not get in this chart. Uh, it's just it's just the giant planets, yeah. So yes. uh, it's uh, I don't know. I, I took the data from the exoplanet.au catalog and I restricted to more than one Jupiter mass. Um, that was... right. now there might be there might be some uh, some issue with uh, with how the variables are are taken into account, which is very common with these databases. Yeah. Depends on whether the, the mass is estimated or measured or not. Yeah, but yeah. When, when there was no mass uh, taken, I, I used the radius. So I thought that I could uh, avoid uh, excluding the transiting data. This because way. There, are, there, are, uh, there are many more, many more giant planets discovered by transits, for instance, than, than by uh, direct detection while it was a ratio or maybe you were one to two in the in yeah the okay I, I thought that most, not possible so. i thought that most of the transiting data well lots of them transiting planets were not giant planet or less than one jupiter mass well of course the, but giant uh, hot jupiters are unless you exclude hot jupiters in this data no, yeah. but if you don't exclude hot jupiters although they are fairly rare uh, mm. there are plenty of them in the in the kepler uh, in the yeah kepler. yeah no I, I i will definitely check okay I, I, <laughs> i'm sorry if i spread it fake news i thought no 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 no, 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 no <laughs> because 
No, no, it, it's, it's, these databases are some, some uh, quite often uh, misleading, depending, uh, you have to be very careful. But I was, I was wondering uh, whether, for instance, you excluded the uh, hot Jupiters, which could have- No, been, yeah, no, no, that's a good, yeah, that's a good one. I will, I will but, try to but understand. Then I had, a, I had another question. So you show, yeah. I think it was for HR uh, 8799, uh, you yeah. show all the possible, uh, all the possible fit to the orbits, and then you show uh, only the ones that that are stable, which is of course much more restricted. But then yeah. there was a mention in the graph that these are the coplanar ones. Yeah, that I, I have so cheated a bit. Uh, yeah. So that that excluded uh, a bit more of the of the data, but uh, okay. I think that most of the most of the constraints were coming from the okay, so, uh, dynamically stable. But so, I, so that I, was that, that was my, my question: whether it was more most um, mostly came from the coplanar uh, constraint or from uh, from stability. Okay. No, I, I think it was coming mostly from the stability. Yeah. Okay, and but does it mean that when you when you impose stability, then most of them are coplanar, or you can have some uh, weird, very inclined uh, system. No, I think I think that was uh, indeed the case that uh, the, the coplanar, uh, hypo yeah, that uh, that the fit was. Uh, okay. So I did not. Uh, this is not uh, my fit, so I, I'm I'm less sure. I, I will I will check, but I think that's uh, uh, that the near coplanarity at least was uh, was. Uh, and and Jen, one just one thing, one last question. So you yeah. you show these criteria for. Uh, for uh, stability, like uh, one easy one was just uh, like one th one third of the heat radius, yeah. and you may or may not know, but Sean likes to build the crazy systems with like one million planets in uh, in various things. So I don't know if you've seen, it. but for instance, I was wondering how do you put uh, how does for instance Trojan Trojan planets do fit with this criterion? Is it a, sp a special case that? Uh... Uh, that's that is indeed a special case. That's, okay. That is right. That's. Uh... <laughs> yeah, that's a, usually that's a criteria we use uh, that is a bit more statistical. So it's uh, it's uh, the planet w which are within this yeah. three radius are statistically very likely to be unstable. But there are some. There are always the trojans that are kind of uh, yeah. <laughs> perturbing the. In your in your defense, none of the crazy systems uh, imagined by Shen has been observed yet. I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we will. <laughs> oh, one. He says one. When? <laughs> uh, soon, soon. Soon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so, so thanks, thanks again for the for yeah, the thank seminar. You. Thank you. Cool. Any any last questions? All right. I'll ask one more, uh, and then I'll then I'll ask you offline the other ones. Is there a link? What is the link between falling evaporating bodies and exozodes? Is it just the age of the star, or is it something more? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure actually. There's a, I think sometimes there are kind of uh, blurry lines between exocomets, falling evaporating bodies, and uh, at exozodes. I, I, I admit I'm not. Uh, I, yeah, I know that. Uh, yeah, I, I know that exozodes is a very similar. With that I'm not sure if there's a difference on where do they come from the system. Like, okay. yeah, it's a similar problem in terms of how to get enough mass close to stars where you observe it in a certain way. And yeah. I didn't know if there was if there was already a link or not. Uh, exosodes uh, are they not uh, stable around the sun, close to the sun? Like, yeah, they're very close in. Yeah, they're detected yeah. very close. In. If, they, if they are stable, that could be the difference. Falling evaporating bodies will disappear uh, after yeah. one or two passages. Yeah. So it's the same with exosodes. Like there's dust that's stable, but it's how the dust got there. And one yeah. possibility is it's basically the same kind of thing. Comets got scattered in. Or, or yeah. maybe not. That's just one one possibility. Yeah, I'm familiar. Or yeah, some people on the, my team work on white dwarf pollution, and this is very similar with uh, how to create a disk debris disk very close to the white dwarf. Probably they being sent there there by a giant planet, maybe. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Cool. Well, I think we should stop there. Thanks again for the great talk, Leticia. Thank you. And I uh, appreciate it. Thanks for the talk. It was it was fantastic, and uh, I hope everyone enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Everyone. Have a good weekend. Thank you for the talk and thank you for attending.